If you don't want to appear in the recording, you may always turn off your video screen and then you won't show up on YouTube. Okay. There are also a few um, important ways to ask questions as we go along. We recommend that you keep your microphone muted so that we don't get an echo chamber of our audio sound here. Um, but you can always unmute yourself to ask a question. And you can also use the chat box to type in a question and we'll get to it as soon as we can. So without further interruptions, I'll let England introduce herself and we'll dive in. Hi everyone, I'm England and I'm a phase two fellow in AMI's program. So after I spent the six months on the mountain in Highland County last summer, this year I'm in my 12 months of service and I am working as the garden coordinator at Bessie Weller Elementary School in Stanton. Um, and if some of you are local, you might recognize me. I'm also working at the local food drive through at Newtown Baking um, as part of the local drive through farmer's market. So um, actually my capstone project during phase one was to put together a guide for an intentional butterfly habitat uh, specific to Highland County. So this class kind of covers a lot of what I studied for that capstone project. Thanks. And again, um, I'll just say that questions are welcome throughout the presentation through using your voice if your microphone is turned back on or through typing into the chat box you can find on Zoom. Feel free to stop us as we go along and ask for more detail. So we'll dive in to beginning from a place of why we should care about pollinators. And there are any number of reasons. The first of which is that a pollinator, which could be a bumblebee, butterfly, or many other species that we'll talk about as we go along, is a keystone species. You've probably seen those bumper stickers that say, no farms, no food. And that's true. But without pollination, we have no farms and no food. Pollinators underpin the health of our entire ecosystem by allowing for cycles of generation to continue, uh, plants reproducing year after year for more plants and more food. And that's even more amazing when you consider that most of our pollinators have a typically short lifespan. So pollination is one of nature's most fascinating examples of a mutualistic relationship where both parties, the pollinator and the plant, benefit from their interaction and ensuring the health of one requires us to conserve both. Let's look at a specific example there. In the 1996 book, The For Forgotten Pollinators, Buchmann and Nobbin established that animal pollinators are needed for the re reproduction of 90% of flowering plants and up to a third of human food crops. But, the research that you see on your screen looks like it's even more than a third in many cases. So in this research, which came from West Africa, pollination by honeybees and wild bees increased yield quality on average up to 62%, while exclusion of pollinators created a decrease of 37% in cotton and 59% in sesame. So we should note that this comes from an example of monocropping, a field in which only one crop was planted. And that made the impact of the pollinators, or lack thereof, easier to manage. But our region is host to incredible biodiversity, especially in those places where monocropping has been resisted, in diverse farms and in native woodlands and meadows. So just imagine the host of specialized pollinators that are working in our ecosystem to keep new growth viable. Another reason that we should prioritize pollinators is for enjoyment. They bring color and excitement to your gardens and are often beautiful additions to your yard. Fluttering pollinators are a source of wonder, especially for young children, and they can be educational for kids too. Together, you can learn and discuss things like flower structure, plant reproduction, and insect behavior. These gardens can also be educational for your neighbors. Beautiful gardens could be a conversational topic to help you bring up the importance of pollinators. 
bringing this up in a positive light could be helpful by reminding neighbors that the chemical use in typical lawns will negatively impact those pollinators. You never know how this information could change someone's perspective or habits regarding the use of chemicals in lawn care or agriculture. Another benefit of pollinator gardens is that it helps you become familiar with insects. And for some, this familiarity could help one overcome a fear of bees if they learn about how beneficial they are. Gardening in general, and for pollinators, can help boost your mental health too. So pollinators are definitely a great source of enjoyment. So that's a global look at why conservation with an eye toward pollinators is so necessary when it comes to feeding our entire world. But now let's zoom in on our home here in the Shenandoah Valley and Allegheny Highlands. So our region is um, broadly known as the Central Appalachian Broadleaf Forest. It comprises nine states with varied elevation from about 300 feet to over 6,000 feet. And the entire area is subject to distinct seasons. You can think of the footprint roughly following the southern half of the Appalachian Trail. And we comprise agricultural zones from 5A to 7A. The primary vegetation within the Central Appalachian Broadleaf Forest is determined by elevation. And before settlement, our original vegetation provided continuous cover and was able to support a diversity of pollinators with really small home ranges. That's because they had enough different plants that saw to their needs close to home, they didn't have to travel far to find what they needed. Today, as agriculture and development more broadly um, have impacted our pollinators, many have had to extend those home ranges. Uh, but we can get back to a healthy ecosystem with enough diversity to really allow those pollinators to thrive once more. So here's a look at some of the categories of pollinator species we host here. Bees, butterflies, beetles, birds, moths, and flies. As we move into the specifics, we're going to take a look at some examples of the kind of plants each pollinator serves. That will help us begin to get a picture of the coevolution that led to plant pollinator partnerships specific to each species. So we're going to start with a familiar one. A look at our bees. Most of us have learned a bit about honeybees. They've been very much a topic of cultural conversation in the last several years as we tend to uh, look at our bees with a little bit more concern. But honeybees were native to Europe and imported over 400 years ago. And they make up only one species of the many, many kinds of bees in our ecosystem. There are nearly 4,000 species of native ground and twig nesting bees in the U.S. And some have colonies, but others live a solitary life. Native bees currently pollinate a lot more crops than you have probably heard about. And they can be encouraged to do even more if we come to the place where we no longer have honeybees to rely on and need that to happen. If suitable sources of nectar, pollen, and water are provided, we can rely on our native bees picking up some of the heavy lifting that uh, honeybees are doing for us now. So the graphic you have on the screen shows some of the various sorts of bees that we have locally and the flowers that they are most likely to visit. I can tell you that it has certainly made me revisit my feelings on sweat bees, which I previously um, had classed with mosquitoes in being an annoyance with no benefit. That's definitely not true. And I've also provided a picture of a lovely columbine over on that left side of your screen, which gives a really good um, picture of the kind of flowers that most bees and honeybees in particular need to do their work of gathering nectar and pollen. They're really attracted to the contrast provided by bright whites, yellows, and blues. 
They use nectar guides to find where they're going and prefer flowers with a really fresh, pleasant aroma. If they've got a landing platform that helps them get into a more tubular flower, that's even better. And that's something that you can see clearly on that columbine. They've got a place to land and rest and then a clear direction to zoom into the flower and collect that pollen, transport it across our garden in the beneficial way they're so good at. This graphic with the chart um, is a lot of information and will be in one of the resources we'll be sending you at the end of the class so you can look at it in more detail. Hey, okay, so butter are my favorite pollinator. They also contribute to pollination as they flutter between different plants throughout the day. However, they are a little bit less efficient pollinators than bees because they lack a specialized structure for collecting pollen. So butterflies use their long tongues to probe for nectar, which is their main food source. So you'll often see them buttering between multiple plants throughout the day. Butterflies pollinate just as they're going between plants for their own food. Uh, butterflies also favor plants that are flat, clustered flowers that give them a landing pad to rest on. And uh, some species also enjoy eating fermented or rotting fruits for their nectar too. Butterflies have great vision and are often attracted to brightly colored flowers. So things like reds, purples, yellows, and orange are great for butterflies. And they also need ample sources of nectar that are deeply hidden within the flower since they do probe with long tongues. Now for attracting butterflies to the garden, it'll take way more than just nectar to entice them to make your garden their home. Passerbys will kind of flutter through and stop for sources of nectar but incorporating host plants invites them to really stay for a while. Host plants are required for the larval or caterpillar growth and development, and each species of butterfly has a unique set or of ideal host and nectar plants. For example, um, the only plant that hosts monarchs is milkweed, so they will only lay eggs and the caterpillars will only eat um, during their growth development on uh, milkweed plants. So many insects cannot feed on the on milkweed because it releases a poisonous sap and monarchs actually ingest that sap as a survival strategy that makes them distasteful for, for predators. Overall, the best way to entice butterflies to visit and reproduce in your pollinator garden is to plant a variety of native host and nectar plants, but we will get more into native plants in a bit. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, when the bees are out um, gathering nectar and, and whatever, and then they go to a hive and then they make honey, correct? Correct. All the bees or just some bees? It's just some bees. Mm -hmm. The queen bee, her job is to lay eggs um, and to tend the hive in that way, create more workers. So she's not heading out to collect pollen on her own. Um, she's subsisting on what is brought back to her by the other members of her hive. Um, so so all bees collectively make honey for the family. So are you asking about the function of the various honeybees in one hive, or are you asking about um, different species of bees? Sort of the different species. I mean, we, we all know what the honey hives look like and so on. So the bees are collecting honey, I mean nectar and make honey. I guess my real question is, when the butterflies are here, are they only making, collecting nectar for their, their particular individual food source? Yeah, essentially butterflies are just collecting it as, as their food source and then they, they do pollinate as a result of like flying so to different They places. don't collect it for they don't collect it to make another product or for another individual. For butterflies, it's every butterfly for themselves in terms of food collection. Okay, thank you. Sure. So the next pollinator we're going to look at are beetles. And beetles generally get a bad rap from farmers. We don't often think of them in the category of pollinators to protect like bees and butterflies, but they do a surprising amount of pollination. 
There are over 300, sorry, excuse me, over 30,000 species of beetle found in the United States, and many of them can be found on flower heads. Beetles aren't as efficient as bees as a pollinator, um, and they sometimes are kind of messy eaters. They eat our plants as well as the pollen, can leave behind damage and mess, and they're also tricky in terms of very few farmers are trained on differentiating our beetles. So sometimes um, we try and exclude them all, not knowing who is friend and who is foe. However, beetles do a significant amount of pollination almost by mistake as they wander between different species, um, dropping pollen as they go. They've Plants that have evolved to um, cooperate with beetle pollination tend to be large, strongly scented, and have their sexual organs exposed. So magnolia is a classic example of that. Um, but sweet shrub, pawpaws, and yellow pond lilies also fall into the category. And here you can see on the slide the commonalities in shape um, and in design that these flowers have that make them um, advantageous for beetle pollination. Here we come to one of my very favorite animals. In our region, most bird pollination is conducted by hummingbirds and in particular by this hummingbird, which is a ruby-throated hummingbird. And the one that you have in the picture on the slide is the female. You can tell because she does not have the bright ruby colored throat. Hummingbirds love brightly colored flowers, um, particularly scarlet, but they will also pollinate orange, more of a dull red or white flowers. And this is one cool example where annuals and even non-native ornamental plants play a huge role in have increasing pollination in forest edges because they provide enough of a food source that our hummingbirds stop and stay for a while when just their few targeted native plants like cardinal flowers or trumpet vines may not be enough of a food source we can support them with other flowers or with the kind of nectar that many of us hang on the ed edges of our porches. Hummingbirds also see color very clearly where bees don't. Um, so sometimes if you are out in the summer in the garden with a bright colored shirt on, you may find that a hummingbird pauses in front of you and hovers and considers whether or not you are flower. Um, that happened to me recently and it's always um, a sweet encounter. And next, we will look at pollination by moth. This is an area in which there's lots of really recently emerging research. So we're forever finding more interesting things about our world. Generally, moths are less colorful than butterflies, but they do also play a strong role in pollination. They are most attracted to flowers with a sweet strel or even um, a, a really flowery aroma as long as it's emitted at night or late afternoon. You can tell a moth from a butterfly by the fact that they are mainly active at night and that they have very fuzzy antennae. So I want to draw your attention to the flower that is on the left side of your screen. This is Jimson weed, also known as thorn apple or devil snare, and it is an invasive nightshade. So while we're showing many images of flowers that you can plant to attract the various pollinators to come and stay in your garden, I don't recommend this one. But the reason I'm including it is that it demonstrates both the primary and secondary ways that mobs move pollen. Primary way being from feeding, and this tubular shape invites the moth to land or hover on near the edge of the plant and stick its long tongue like a butterfly down to receive the pollen from inside of this funnel-shaped jimson weed. 
but it also, because of the narrowness of the uh, funnel shape, can demonstrate the second way that moths move pollen. And that's that they bump into flowers and pick it up with their fuzzy bodies and then go off and clumsily bump into the next flower, and transport the pollen that way. So that research on the way that the moths are moving pollen through their bodies and not just through their tongues has led us to believe that they are far more generalist than we ever thought. So they're not only pollinating these funnel-shaped, bright white, night blooming flowers like the jimson weed or like the honeysuckle, as we first thought, but also far more flowers that don't even fit as neatly into this category we've described. Similarly, we are learning more all the time about the role of flies in pollination. Like beetles, the number of fly species and the fact that flies are generalists and which visit many species of plants should encourage us to think a little bit more positively about their presence in our gardens. Recent research indicates that flies primarily pollinate small flowers that bloom under shade in seasonally moist habitats. And they really, really like stinky things. Plants pollinated by the fly include the pawpaw, which is a, a special one for our region, as well as dead horse arum and skunk cabbage, which you have there on this screen. They also pollinate many members of the carrot family, like Queen Anne's lace. So the shape that flies tend to be attracted to can really vary. They like funnel-like flowers, but they also like complex trap-like flower shapes. And you can see how the skunk cabbage may be a kind of trap that a larger pollinator could get stuck inside, but a fly has the freedom to just head right back at it. Similarly, the Queen Anne's lace has got the uh, center black spot that is said to attract bugs in. But a fly is not caught in that trap and is able to pollinate the Queen Anne's lace very effectively. So let's talk a little bit about threats to pollinators. There are plenty of threats to pollinators, which is why it's important that we all learn to incorporate safe habitats for them within our gardens at home or our farm space. Conventional agriculture is a huge culprit here, both in terms of chemical use and habitat destruction for monocropping. Additionally, pollinator habitats are also altered or destroyed due to urban development, resource extraction, and unfortunately, suburban lawn culture. The use of pesticides and herbicides are a common practice in American lawn culture, such as getting out there and spraying and destroying simple weeds like dandelions that are often the first source of food for bees in the spring. This problem with making a pollinator garden in your neighborhood may help to educate or encourage neighbors to think of pollinators too. And it doesn't help to include a sign near your garden that says something like no spray zone or spraying the weeds. Climate change or extreme weather patterns is also another factor that poses a threat to delicate pollinator species and the plants that they need to thrive. So with these threats encroaching on their livelihood, it's important that we take a step to plant the pollinators. So the importance of pollinators and all they contribute to our ecosystem. Now let's chat about cultivating a healthy habitat for them. So pollinators need, like all things, they need food, water, and shelter. I'm sorry, like all living things, they need food, shelter, and water. So let's start with food. Many pollinators may visit your garden, so diversity is really key here. You want a wide range of perennials and annuals with trees and shrubs to provide both pollen and nutrient-rich nectar sources in a wide variety of those pollinators from early spring to late fall. A diverse range of colors will also help attract a diverse range of pollinators too. So in addition to diversity, using native plants is also highly important. Native plants are those that are best 
adapted to our particular geographic region according to climate, soil conditions, and rainfall. According to some research from Penn State, native plants are up to four times more attractive to pollinators. And essentially, the more a pollinator garden resembles a meadow, the more attractive it will be to pollinators. So uh, we will get more into native plants of diversity in a bit, but let's move on to water. So in addition to food, pollinators obviously require a water source for drinking and reproduction. You can provide a source of water by incorporating a small bird bath filled with gravel or stones, which is kind of what's in the pictures on the slide on your screen. Um, or you can also create a small muddy puddle area in the corner of your garden. If you're lucky to have a pond, a stream, or a spring nearby, those are also great for pollinators. You can consider adding something like a water garden feature, um, maybe like a built-in small pond or a fountain to your pollinator garden area. I will say you should stay attentive to whichever water source you choose for pollinators. It should be placed in a safe spot that they can quickly escape to nearby shelter if needed. And a shady location will help keep the water from overheating throughout the summer and from um, algae levels getting kind of out of hand. Be sure to replace the water two to three times per week to keep it fresh and to help fend off mosquitoes. Next is shelter. Was that pollinators need shelter. Question? Were those marbles in that one? Yeah, they are marbles. Um, it's kind of a more fun, like kid-friendly way to incorporate a small bird bath with stones. Essentially, the stones or marbles are kind of like a landing pad for tiny pollinators that so they can land on that and drink the water without, you know, and drowning in that. Water. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so shelter. Um, pollinators use shelter to stay safe in intense weather, to camouflage from predators, and to nest or overwinter in. An easy way to provide built-in shelter is to cluster your plantings close together um, that will act as a safe space for them to rest or sleep. You can also create small rock piles or leave areas of tr twigs and branches in your garden. Another beneficial practice to adopt is waiting until the late spring to do your garden cleaning. In addition to pollinators, lots of other insects and critters will also use your dead garden to overwinter. They like to use the inside of hollowed out stems or dead plants, fallen branches or trees. Next, I think we're gonna talk about selection. So an important um, consideration for cultivating a healthy pollinator habitat is most definitely site selection. A spot that gets full to partial sun is best, so you'd want to aim for about six to eight hours of sunlight per day in order for the plants to thrive as well as the pollinators. You should consider the garden's proximity to a water source too. You'll need to water not only the plants, but have a water source for the pollinators too. The site you choose should also be safe from traffic, safe from chemicals, safe from big predators, and also from the elements. So essentially you don't want to plant a pollinator garden right next to a high traffic roadside, and you should avoid planting along your neighbor's fence line that might end up using chemicals. A great site to plant a pollinator garden could be close or right up to your house, or maybe near a large tree or a stand of trees, and most definitely in a chemical-free zone. Now that we've gone, gone over what pollinators need to survive, I think we should talk more about the importance of planting with natives. So I stated this earlier, but it definitely warrants repeating. Um, research from Penn State shows that plants, native plants are four times more attractive to pollinators than non-natives. So native plants tend to be a little bit low maintenance and are easily received by wildlife. These plants are the ones that are best adapted to our location based off our climate, our rainfall average, and soil conditions. Planting with natives ensures that we aren't introducing an invasive species that could take over and outcompete beneficial plants in your landscape. However, I will add that just because a plant is not native does not always mean it's invasive. When I say invasive, I'm referring to a plant that becomes dominant in your landscape and will choke out the other plants. So something like common ivy or Virginia creeper are often invasive in our region. 
There are plenty of non-native, non-invasive pollinator-friendly plants that you can include in your garden too. So these are things like zinnia, cosmos, heliotrope, and lantana. These are all great flowering plants to incorporate for pollinators. But let's go over the native plants. We're pretty lucky in this area for a pretty biodiverse region in Virginia. There are so many plants that are native to this area that pollinators will thrive on. And the list is pretty extensive, so I've kind of narrowed it down to these few, like willows, elderberry, red bud, meadow sweet, and a few flowers like wild bergamot, cone flowers, milkweeds, asters, goldenrod, phlox, and blazing star. But this list is really distilled and there are so many more natives out there. We will be sending out some more extra resources, um, but I definitely encourage you to do your own research too, because there are lots of sources like from universities or plant societies. And um, you can also call like your native, uh, I'm sorry, not your native, your local plant nurseries to ask about the native plants that they sell. I'll put in a plug here for um, the natural garden in the Harrisonburg area. They helped AMI out last year with a class on our native perennials. And I was so impressed with the encyclopedic knowledge they have of great plants for any spot, any soil condition, level of sunlight. They tend to be a wonderful resource for that. And one thing that I learned from them too is that many of the native species that are so valuable to our pollinators, you might think of as weeds if you didn't um, study pollinators in this level of detail. One that I comes to mind for me is goldenrod, which is here on our slide. Um, and goldenrod is so important because of where it blooms in the season, being one of the later blooming flowers to make sure that we continue to support our pollinators across the full season. Grace, and I like that you pointed out that it looks um, like some, if you're not familiar with the plants, some native pollinator plants do look like weeds. And that kind of goes back to, saying that the more your pollinator garden looks like a meadow, the more it will attract pollinators. So let's talk about the importance of diversity too. Um, it is a common theme that we've talked about, but it's really important. Uh, since pollinators really come in all shapes and sizes, there's no one size fits all plant that will benefit every pollinator that visits your landscape throughout the season. So the best way to make sure that there is something for everyone who visits is to plant diversely. This is, means incorporating a wide range of trees, shrubs, and both perennials and annuals. Um, that ensures that there is an abundant source of food and shelter available to all pollinators that will visit from early spring till late fall. Um, and there's a wonderful bloom progression chart for our area and one of the resources that we will be sending with you. So now let's take a look at some of the things that we can do specifically on farms to support our pollinators. Most of the pollinator friendly practices on farms are also in line with the regenerative practices that AMI promotes. Limiting or better yet eliminating pesticides and herbicides is key because not only are they poison that has been linked to colony, colony collapse disorder in bees, but weeds and plants gone to seed also provide critical food sources for our pollinators. Minimizing tillage helps to avoid disturbing habitat for ground dwelling bees and using cover crops to build soil fertility without disruption is healthier for both the ecosystem and our pollinators to have food sources. Farm borders and riparian buffers provide great opportunities to incorporate native plants and scattering water throughout the landscape helps a whole lot too. Consider planting an intentional row for pollinators. At the AMI Farm in Augusta Health, we call that farmscape, and we often use it to line each row of our crops um, to mark out space, bring beauty that makes our farmers happy and keep our pollinators happy too. Lastly, consider living a bit of wild in your landscape like bolted rows or fallen stalks that can become food or shelter for pollinators, as well as muddy puddles, which are a crucial source of minerals and vitamins um, and just good diet for butterflies. Celebrate the intersection of wilderness and industry is the way I like to think of it. 
I'm going to pause to see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, okay, this is fascinating to me. Uh, in the news today, Bayer is paying $10 billion to settle claims that Roundup causes cancer. So not only is Roundup, um, also known as glycophosphate, a major concern to our pollinators, but also to our own health. And we're going to come back to that uh, very shortly when we come to things that you can do to support your pollinators. But first, let's talk about how you can help within your garden. So the list for how to support pollinators in your garden looks very similar to the list for how to support them in a farm. But the smaller scale provides the opportunity for a little citizen silence. So I love the recommendation of beginning a, a garden journal where you can document the time your plants bloom, which pollinators you see coming to visit each plant, how many new species you spot, really all of the information that you wish, wish to collect will be useful to you to track what happens year after year and continue to improve the way that your garden nurtures pollinators. A little bit more advice, as we've said several times now, try to use native plants where possible. They often have more pollen or better mechanisms for pollinators to find them than varieties that have been heavily altered by selective breeding. That means things like double blooms um, can often interfere with the way that our pollinators access what they need to eat. Incorporating fragrant and colorful herbs uh, often doubles your impact. You enjoy them in the kitchen, your pollinators enjoy them in your garden. And also remember that your home is not an island. So connectivity with the surrounding landscape is desirable. It loosens the pressure for you of needing to provide every aspect a pollinator needs for a healthy life. And it also um, can improve the corridors, I guess, of um, pollinators moving through landscapes so that we don't have that ecosystem fragmentation that is such a risk for the health of our pollinators. So as we look toward the broader ecosystem, I wanna take this moment to mention with thanks some beneficial actions that um, wildlife does for us other than pollination. So this is my moment of thanks for birds and bats that provide healthy natural ecosystem pest control and allow us to really have successful farms and gardens without relying on chemical pesticides. Thanks to all the bats for eating those mosquitoes, making the garden an enjoyable place to be. And we also want to mention a few things that we humans can do to support healthy pollinator ecosystems. Um, firstly, we can advocate for wise management of public spaces. Reducing, reducing pesticide use at institutions like schools and hospitals, parks, golf courses, can be a hugely beneficial way to reduce pesticide drift as well as to create islands that are safe and chemical free for all of our wildlife. Uh, equally, raising awareness and advocating for the presence of woodlands and meadows to be valued as they are instead of seen as a blank slate for development can be transformative in establishing healthy pollinator corridors and again resisting ecosystem fragmentation as well as creating a culture of conservation. Economics can also play a really powerful role. This is where supporting organic and local regenerative agriculture has such power, as well as supporting your local beekeepers. Because if we can keep those folks in business and bolster the people who are looking out for our pollinators, again, we are contributing to a cultural shift that will make all of us healthier in the long run. And lastly, education for youth and adults is fundamental for a society that values biodiversity. So share something you learned today with a friend or family member. And before we go to questions and leave you, 
There's so much more to learn about pollinators that we didn't have time for today. So we encourage you to check out some of the resources on your screen now. The first one on the list, uh, which provided much of the information in today's presentation, is from the Selecting Plants for Pollinators Guide for the Central Appalachian Broadleaf Forest, which is produced by the Pollinator Partnership and NAPPC, which is the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. I highly recommend it. You can also learn more about Allegheny Mountain Institute here, our fellowship program and our other work um, at amifellows.org. And you're welcome to contact England and me with any further questions. We don't know the answer. We will do our best to find it out and get back to you. And it looks like we have a few moments for questions now. So either in the chat or by unmuting your microphone, um, feel free to ask anything you have. You also have our emails there if you come up with a question later. Um, the little white butterflies that are some, I'm using butterflies as a generic term, are they moths or are they butterflies? They're white and they're usually around my vegetable garden. Yes, yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. They are often called cabbage moths, but they're actually cabbage butterflies. And um, even though they're a butterfly, they're considered a garden pest because they really eat up our brassica plants. So. Yeah, and I would eat our brassicas when they're in the flea beetle stage. Mm -hmm. And so that is why we always recommend a um, safe insect netting as a physical barrier to try and keep them out of our brassicas and hopefully finding their source of food for the beetles elsewhere. England, did you have more to add? I think I accidentally cut you off. Sorry, it's, my, my it's just bad and disappointing. You try so hard and it's just, anyway. <laughs> it answered that question. Go oh, ahead. Uh, you didn't mention Monarda or Bee Balm. Is that not a native? That is actually, and I, I called it wild bergamot. So it's kind of one that has a lot of terms. It's called Monarda or wild bergamot or Bee Balm and it's all mm -hmm. the same plant. Because I always have that in my garden. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorites. And also the little leaf linden tree. I don't know if it's native, but I know that the bees and the butterflies love that tree and it's real pretty. I believe that is uh, one of the natives I saw on a list while researching. And you will receive um, a really extensive list um, that is in some of the resources that we'll share with you in your resource kit. Uh, I think it would take days for us to cover all of the native plants we have that support one or the other kind of our mini pollinators, which is really hopeful, I think, um, if we are able to just celebrate natives and learn not only our pollinator species, but our native species. There are a lot of ways you can do right. We have a book recommendation in the group chat, which is Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy. Great resources. Um, Oh, Wild Virginia is doing a book club in July and reading Nature's Best Hope together. So there's a link there. Thank you, Grace, for putting that into our group chat. Any other questions or recommendations from our crowd here? Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, you have emails for England and myself, and we will be getting you resource kits and the link to our recorded video in the next several days. So feel free to keep in touch or even to make requests for further classes you would like to see from AMI. Um, we're happy to learn it and share it with you. I have one more comment. Sure. Um, I ordered from Tennessee Wholesale Nursery um, milkweed, milkweed roots, for lack of a better word, and they came in and I now have 
milkweed stems coming up. So uh, I, I promised a couple of shares for some of my friends, but um, you can plant milkweed. It, it, it hasn't gotten to the huge, the huge um, plants yet, but um, anyhow, they do grow in the area and there are sources out there. I couldn't find any locally, but I did not know about this place in Harrisonburg. But um, Tennessee Wholesale Nursery has a, seems to have a pretty good supply or is a pretty good resource or resource for that. Awesome. Thank you. There is also um, a Charlottesville native plant nursery up in the Ruckersville area. And for some reason, I'm completely blanking right now. But there is also one locally available. We'll see if we can find the name of that. And if so, I'll share it with you when we send out um, all of the information to each of you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And um, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.